Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by Chike Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, One to Rule Them All, God in African Philosophy. If you read around in older literature about traditional religious beliefs in Africa, there is one word you'll come across repeatedly, primitive. The epithet conjures up a picture of pre-technological native folk worshipping things like rivers, trees, and stones. As we've seen in the case of the Sokoto Caliphate, this is exactly how Muslims who lived in Africa sometimes characterized the practices of the so-called pagans with whom they shared the continent. But you don't have to be a 19th century jihadi to associate primitive religion with polytheism. It's commonly supposed that older religions had many gods who were closely associated with features and places of the natural world, the superstition of prehistory. Then, as civilization advanced, humans achieved the more abstract and theologically respectable notion of monotheism, as realized most fully in Judaism, Christianity, and then Islam. Podcast listeners will be used to hearing us set up popular conceptions like this only to knock them down, but in this case the standard view is even more spectacularly wrong than usual. It's patently obvious that sophistication in matters of religion or philosophy is compatible with polytheism. Just consider the Upanishads, or the writings of late ancient Platonists, both of them full of references to multiple divinities. Then too, Muslims and Christians in Africa were wrong to suppose that they had brought monotheism there for the first time. Remember the remarkable ancient Egyptian king Akhenaten, and his worship of a single god represented as the disk of the sun. We covered him back in episode 4. Finally, and most relevantly for us in today's episode, many scholars of traditional African religion would reject the description of it as polytheistic. What we find in some cultures there is a religious system not unlike late ancient Platonism, with a single first principle that stands over a multitude of lesser divinities. The scholar of African religion, I. Bolaji Idowu, has called this diffused monotheism and rebuked Western scholars for their condescending view that deity is a philosophical concept which savages are incapable of framing. Here we're already in danger of replacing one sweeping claim with another, though. As Idowu himself remarked elsewhere, it is foolhardy to generalize on Africa. His caution is well-placed, given the vast number of peoples and language groups in Africa. So we won't be laying down universal statements like that made by John Mabiti, already familiar to us for his ideas about African theories of time, when he wrote that, every African people recognizes one god. To place all emphasis on the worship of a single greatest god is not only to paint with a rather broad brush, but also risks accepting the terms of the standard hierarchy, with sophisticated monotheism, whether diffused or not, placed above more simple-minded polytheism. A strident voice of protest against this tendency was that of Okot Pabitek, whom we met in episodes 15 and 16. He complained about Western scholars who dress up African deities with Hellenic robes and parade them before the Western world to show that Africans were as civilized as Europeans. Still, it is a striking fact that many traditional African communities do posit a single god who reigns supreme over other divinities as well as humans. Among the best studied cases is the belief system of the Yoruba of Nigeria, one of the largest ethnic groups of Africa and one that was particularly hard hit by the slave trade. At first glance, they seem to offer an extreme example of polytheism, with some scholars counting as many as 1,700 Yoruba gods, perhaps the most extensive pantheon in Africa. These divinities, called Orisha, are given responsibility for natural events. Thus, it is said that the river goddess Yemoja destroys bridges when she is angry. The Orisha are seen as fitting recipients of prayer and sacrifice. However, there is also a supreme god who created the Orisha and uses them as emissaries, assistants, or ministers in his dealings with the world. This highest god is called Oludumare, One tale records how the other divinities attempted to challenge his authority, but were forced to submit to him. Thus, a Yoruba poem says, Be there 1,400 divinities of the home, be there 1,200 divinities of the marketplace, yet there is not one divinity to compare with Olodumare. 
Despite his centrality, Olud Mare is strangely absent from everyday religious practice and discourse among the Yoruba. Instead, individual Orisha are made the object of cult practices and have their own priests. In stories about the fashioning of the world, Olutumare sends a kind of deputy, the god Orisha Nla, to do the actual work of creation. This dynamic is found among other peoples as well, which has prompted some to hypothesize that the African god has somehow hidden himself or withdrawn from humans and the world. Or perhaps lesser divinities like the Orisha of Yoruba belief are mere intermediaries between the highest god and the world. A particularly radical version of that thesis, which would push African religion towards pure monotheism, would see the lesser divinities as mere manifestations of a single deity. But a more plausible interpretation may be that it would seem overly familiar to pray or sacrifice to a highest god like Oldumare. Just as subjects should not dare to approach the king in a traditional African society, with his regal power being exercised through subordinates, so religious customs would involve dealing directly only with lesser divinities and not the king of heaven. This would fit well with a more general tendency to draw parallels between human political power and divine authority. The Yoruba used the epithet king for both Oludumare and the creator god Orisha Nla, while lesser gods are sometimes described as ministers in a royal court. A Yoruba prayer to another of the Orisha goes as follows. There is no place where Osun, who is powerful as a king, is not known. The whole world prostrates to the king. There is no limit to his activity on earth. Meanwhile, human kings are invested with religious authority, with the roles of monarch and high priest coinciding in many traditional societies. The dividing line between human and divine rulership is further blurred by the fact that some spiritual entities began their careers as human heroes, or monarchs, becoming divinized upon their death. This brings us to another well-known aspect of African religion, namely the spiritual role of human ancestors. Some would even question whether there is a clear distinction between divinities and ancestors, and not unreasonably so, when you consider that among some peoples, even the highest god is termed a grand ancestor. Still, deceased humans seem most often to occupy a role in the pantheon below the lesser gods and to serve as intermediaries to the divine realm. A distinction is sometimes drawn between the ancestors whose names are still known, the so-called living dead, and the ancestors who passed into the spirit world long ago and have been forgotten. That distinction should make us suspicious of an idea sometimes put forward in the debate about the African understanding of time we examined in the previous episode, namely that traditional peoples can look back into history only as far as they can name their ancestors. The issue may be a more pragmatic one. Thus, the Kagaru speak simply of a time long ago to refer to the age before living memory. The picture so far, then, seems to be one in which there is a hierarchy of spiritual beings with more recently deceased family members as the closest to those of us who are still living, then lesser divinities, and finally the highest god who stands over all things. We might expect that this highest god should possess divine attributes, marking his transcendence, like those we find in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And indeed, various peoples describe God not only as creator and king, but also as unknowable, all-powerful, and all-knowing. A hymn recited by the Twa people, who live in the forests of Central Africa, says, In the beginning was God, today is God, tomorrow will be God. Who can make an image of God? He has no body. He is as a word which comes out of your mouth. That word, it is no more. It is past, and still it lives. So is God. Notice the interesting implicit point made here about language. The hymn seems to allude to the fact that the meanings of words persist for a long time, perhaps in the understanding of those who hear them, even though the utterance of a word is a momentary affair. Likewise, God persists unchanging through time. Many other groups likewise insist on God's immutability or even timelessness. Thus, the Nupe say that God will outlive eternity, the Akan that no one saw the beginning, none shall see the end except God, the Kikuyu that he is the same as he was yesterday, and the Ila that God has no where and no when. Yet, 
As in the Abrahamic religions, the supreme god of African religion is frequently seen also as a more eminent force. There is a widespread association of God with the sky or heaven, and with the sending of the rains that sustain life. Indeed, the Akan name for God, Nyame, seems to be connected with their word for rain, Nyamkom. The Lugbara people of the West Nile region call their supreme god Adroa, meaning far away, as contrasted to Adro, or nearby, a term that can be used for lesser spiritual beings. While this may suggest absolute transcendence for the higher god, it's been suggested that the Lugbara in fact use this terminology to express the way that god is both transcendent and imminent in the world. Adroa and Adro would be just two variants of a single name. Certainly, many African belief systems do recognize an ongoing relationship between God and the world. The Akamba see God as the maker of all things and also call him the cleaver, that is, the principle that causes things to be different from one another. In a trope reminiscent of Plato's cosmological dialogue, the Timaeus, African religions often compare God to a craftsman, like a carpenter or potter, who fashions first the world and then individual humans. God and the lesser divinities also reward good and punish evil, especially wicked political rulers. Here arises an obvious philosophical question. If God and his deputies are at work in the world, how far does their influence reach? Are all things brought about by divine decree? In other words, are African religions determinist? This is one of those questions where we need to proceed carefully without assuming that all traditional religions would give the same answer. Indeed, one can often find contrary indications within the oral traditions of a single group. There are plenty of proverbs, prayers, and songs that do suggest a form of determinism. The Nupe say, Should you do anything that is beautiful, Soko has caused it to be beautiful. Should you do anything that is evil, Soko has caused it to be evil. The Bakongo say that what comes from heaven cannot be resisted. The Akamba end all their prayers with the phrase God willing. And when someone is ill, the Lugbara predict, if God wants him to die, then truly he will die. If God wants him to recover, then truly he will recover. Yet, it is just as easy to find traditional peoples giving naturalistic explanations of events. If the crops are poor, this is as likely to be ascribed to inadequate rainfall as to the gods. Rather than assuming that determinism is rife in African belief, it may be safer to suppose that divine agency is invoked for explaining remarkably significant or unusual events. African religions, or at least some of them, give little or no role to chance, especially concerning such notable events. God, not randomness, is thus the explanation of last resort. Another reason to doubt that divine causation is pervasive in the world is that many African peoples seem reluctant to ascribe evil to God. Admittedly, some lesser divinities, like the wicked trickster god Esu of Yoruba belief, do inflict punishment and suffering, in the case of Esu, even on other gods as well as humans. But more often, evils are blamed not on the gods, but on malign humans who are working magic, something ethnographers often call witchcraft. The perfect benevolence of God is shown by the fact that some peoples, like the Akamba, do not even bother to pray to him because they assume he will always send good things. Likewise, it is not clear whether God is responsible for the mortality of the human race. Several traditional stories absolve God of responsibility for death, with a nice example being a tale told by the Xhosa of South Africa. God sends Chameleon as a messenger to promise humans immortal life, but he falls asleep and fails to deliver his message in time. Instead, Lizard delivers a corrupted version of the same message, which informs humans that they will die, and so we have done ever since. Similarly, the Maasai say that we will die because the first human was told to announce the divine command, man die and come back again, moon die and stay away. Sadly, he got the decree backwards, resulting in both the death of humans and the continuity of the lunar cycle. Many other religious narratives serve to explain what is otherwise inexplicable or disturbing. Among the most interesting are accounts of human diversity. One story has it that when humans were first created, they were given to eat from different bowls, which explains why various communities speak different languages. Another account plays on the aforementioned description of God as being like a potter who shapes individual humans. He is said to have made different races out of different colors of clay, which explains differentiation of skin color. 
Similarly, the Yoruba say that when their supreme deity, Olodumare, instructed the creator god Orisha Nra to make humans, he fashioned them in all different shapes and colors. Yet all humans come originally from Ile Ife, the fabled city of Yoruba land. The Nuer, finally, maintain that white skin color is a punishment from God. As is clear from these stories, the material we are dealing with is not prehistoric lore, completely untouched by contact with groups and traditions from beyond Africa. It is easy to assume that the information ethnographers have gathered tells us about religious beliefs that have existed in Africa since before the dawn of recorded history. But, as no less an observer than Sigmund Freud remarked, it should not be forgotten that primitive, there's that word again, races are not young races but are in fact as old as civilized races. There is no reason to suppose that, for the benefit of our information, they have retained their original ideas and institutions undeveloped and undistorted. Or, as a more recent scholar has observed while arguing for likely influence of Christianity on the aforementioned Lugbara idea of God as far away, the present situation of terms and meanings is not the one that existed about a hundred years ago. Already some of the evidence we presented in this episode looks suspiciously like it may be influenced by Christianity or Islam. The opening line of that Twa hymn, In the Beginning Was God, sounds rather familiar, doesn't it? And the Akamba habit of ending prayers with the phrase God willing is reminiscent of the pervasive Muslim practice of saying Inshallah, if God wills. In many cases, influence from other religions is explicit. The Yoruba have divinities that are associated with Islam, for example. And influence can go the other way, too. The name of the aforementioned trickster god Isu is sometimes used by Nigerian Muslims to refer to Satan, in place of the traditional Islamic name Iblis. In short, traditional African beliefs are no more isolated than they are monolithic. They have long been shaped by influence from Mediterranean culture, and also by mutual interaction between African peoples. We'll conclude with a fascinating illustration of this point, beliefs about newborn children among the Beng of the Ivory Coast, so you might say that in this episode where going out with a Beng. African religions often suppose that humans reincarnate, often with a suggestion that individual lives are shaped by a destiny chosen or assigned before birth. Thus, the Yoruba say, that which is affixed to one cannot be rectified with medicine. The Bang, too, understand humans to have existed before birth, and their picture of the other realm from which the children have come is clearly influenced by contact with Europeans. They apply the name Rugbe to the place of the afterlife, or perhaps we should say before life, and describe it as a space of economic plenty and social harmony. All languages are spoken there, so when it seems to us that a baby is learning to talk, in fact, she is in the process of forgetting all tongues apart from bang. For this reason, the parents speak to the babies as if they were adults. Newborn babies are strongly tempted to return to the favorable other world, which accounts for infant mortality. To make sure that babies do not give up on their new lives, they are meticulously washed to remove the traces of the rugbe, and given gifts of money to soften the blow. Significantly, this money comes in two forms, cowrie shells, which were used as currency in pre-colonial times, and French coins. In a study of this set of beliefs and practices, Alma Gottlieb concluded that it constitutes a reaction to the cultural damage done to the Beng by French colonialism. The other world, with its lack of poverty and strife, is a figurative representation of the pre-colonial time here indirectly remembered as a halcyon age in which Bang culture had not yet been subjected to foreign exploitation and oppression. Why then do they give the children French coins? Perhaps, speculates Gottlieb, the other world also represents an alternative history in which the introduction of foreign economic practices brought prosperity rather than destitution. Here we see another aspect of the sophistication of African religion, its capacity to adapt in response to changing circumstances. Far from being primitive, the religious beliefs of traditional African peoples raise and often answer the full range of philosophical questions we associate with the Abrahamic faiths. How many gods are there? What form does God's causality take, and is that influence pervasive? How does divine authority relate to human political authority? How can evils be accounted for in a world ruled by a benevolent god? 
Are specific events and features of our experience best explained with reference to nature or in light of divine decree? And as we'll see next time, the same goes for the place of the individual human within the universe God and his deputies have made. We'll be looking at concepts of personhood in African tradition, and asking whether Bobby Bird, a singer who was the Orisha Nla to James Brown's Olodumare, was right to proclaim, I know you got soul. That's right here on the History of Africana Philosophy. Thank <music> you.